just want to start with welcoming everyone and thank you all so much for joining. This is the very first webinar of HipCamp's Project Bloom. Um, for this series, we're going to be focusing on monarch butterflies and other pollinators that help plants reproduce and support wildlife and otherwise enrich our lives. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our excellent panel of speakers for today. So first, joining from West Marin, California, we have Alyssa Ravazio, who is HipCamp's founder and CEO. Uh, she is going to be talking a little bit about why this project is important. Um, then we're going to have Matthew Shepard, who is the Director of Outreach at Xerxes Society. Uh, he's going to be sharing some important information about monarchs and other pollinators and how to steward an environment that is really um, supporting of them. Next, we will have Dean. Uh, Dean is joining from, he, he's a host at Oz Farm. Um, he's going to be sharing his experience stewarding a dynamic and diverse ecosystem, uh, working the landscape on the Northern California coast where there are many pollinators and wild salmon still thriving. Um, and finally, I'd like to introduce Charles Post. Charles is kind of hip camp's resident ecologist who is has helped us build this project. Um, he is going to be chiming in and participating in moderation throughout. Uh, after all of our speakers, we're going to have some Q&A. So you can also use the Q&A function on the Zoom screen there to ask questions throughout the webinar. And then uh, we'll do our best to get those all answered for you. With that started, um, I'm going to first hand it over to Charles Post to give a brief overview of the program. Then we'll hand it over to Alyssa Ravazio, who's going to give her thoughts on why this project is important. So Charles, if you'd like to go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Remy. Yeah, and thanks everybody for being here. It's uh, really incredible to see uh, what started as kind of a, a quick, dreamy conversation with Alyssa, a longtime friend and, and collaborator. Uh, we've we've uh, worked together on a number of projects, and, and this was, uh, yeah, perhaps my favorite uh, kind of seed she planted about, you know, how could we move the needle in pollinator conservation? How could we do something exciting and collaborative and synergistic? And so really just to kind of address what our, what our hope was, was this realization that pollinators really connect us all, right? Pollinators are the behind the scenes, busy workers turning flowers to fruit and pollinating our meadows and creating food, right? One in three bites of food we take is a byproduct of pollination. There are these just magnificent, colorful, incredible uh, species that, that exist and are thriving and yet need our help. And so when Alyssa and I started kind of brainstorming what, what this project could look like and who we could partner with, we, we immediately thought of Xerxes Society. Um, they're a leading group in invertebrate conservation they do an incredible job and we feel so lucky to have Matthew here and their just brilliant team behind the scenes um, who have been creating content and resources and uh, you know much of what they've done for so many years will inform uh, the topics we talk about today. And for a little bit of context, I'm an ecologist by trade. I studied food web ecology and so invertebrates were a big part of my life for many years. So this, this feels very, uh, very fitting. I studied a bird that eats insects. So we'll, we'll learn a little bit about that, how it's not just pollinators that uh, make flowers flowers and fruit fruit, but they also feed so many animals that we maybe take for granted, right? Like the bird song of summer is in many ways a, a byproduct of pollinators existing. And so I'll, I'll, I'll pass it off to Alyssa, um, my dear friend and source of inspiration, and, and she can uh, share a little bit more about what this means to her and what this means to hip camp. Thank you, Charles, and welcome everyone. If you're joining us live, amazing. I know 9 a.m. on a Tuesday is uh, not the easiest time and really appreciate you joining. If you're watching this recorded, also welcome. Thank you for creating the time. Um, and I am dialing in here from uh, West Marin, California, uh, the homelands of the Miwok people. Um, and just so grateful to be here. A huge thank you to Remy and Charles, Dean, Matthew. So excited to be bringing this group together and for all of you to join us. Um, and just want to share a few words. I am not the uh, the scientist or the ecologist or the landowner in the room. So I'm going to be brief and, and then hand it over to the experts. But just want to share a bit about 
why is a camping company so obsessed with pollinators? What's, what's going on here? How do, how do these things all connect? Um, so I, I will reckon um, that most of you, most of us, um, have heard this term, the Anthropocene. Um, which many scientists are arguing um, is a new geological era, as in geological, as in we believe 100,000 years in the future, we'll actually see a distinct striation in the, in the soil uh, when we dig in, into the past in the future. Um, and that this new geological era is going to be defined um, by human impact, Anthropocene, the, the era of, of human. Um, a quick Google search of this world will make it very clear this is not a good thing um, in most people's minds. Uh, we're currently looking at extinction levels roughly about a thousand times uh, pre-human levels. There's obviously very dangerous levels of greenhouse gases building up in our atmosphere. Um, and there's a lot of pollution, our rivers, our soils. Um, I just saw a study that showed about, they asked, actually estimate one in five human deaths is now caused by pollution, which is a very self-inflicted wound, not only to ourselves, but, but to the rest of life on planet. So. So far, I would say the Anthropocene is off to a bit of a rocky start, um, but I will actually call back to one of the, one of the many um, very inspiring conversations Charles and I had where we were talking about this and this word and just kind of how it could be quite sad to think about, you know, the era defined by human was this like really dark, you know, time characterized by all those, those traits we just spoke through. And Charles, I remember you very specifically saying, let's make it a good one. Like, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that prompt of, okay, we're in this era defined by human impact, it's called the Anthropocene, sure, how do we make it a good one? Um, that's just to me the, 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 the really the question worth asking and worth thinking about more than anything else. And so for, for HipCamp, um, our, uh, our, our top value, the thing we talk about the most often is leave it better, which is really an intentional play on leave no trace, another very important ethos in the outdoor, in the outdoor industry, but how, but how do we take it one step further? How do we actually say, let's make that impact of, of humans positive, um, not just neutral, especially given that we are existing in this, um, this time of, uh, of, of man really defining the, the impact on the earth, the Anthropocene. So um, all that said, why, why does a camping company care so much about this? We're still a camping company, right? So one, personally, I'll just share, I'm obsessed with uh, this question and ecosystems. I'm wearing my pollinator yellow today. Um, I text Charles like photos of monarch butterflies all the time. You can see I have my nice butterfly poster. So I just think about this all the time because as Charles said, the pollinators are really what connect us all. And it's really um, they're really at the center of um, every land-based ecosystem there is. Um, if we lose our pollinators, uh, we can't lose our pollinators. So uh, that's, that's part of why I'm so focused on it. Um, the other thing I'll share is as a company that really is rooted in long-term thinking, guess what? If our, if our ecosystems continue to deteriorate, I don't really know if people are going to want to be camping in a couple hundred years. And so really thinking long term about the future and really creating a future where everyone can get outside and access nature and find all of that peace and solitude and beauty that requires very clearly, the science makes it very clear, a strong focus on conservation and even furthermore restoration today. That's how we create a future for outdoor recreation. Um, it, it's essential. Um, and then finally, you know, part of our whole belief at Hip Camp is that when we get people outside, and I know many of you joining us today are hosts who actually make it possible for people to get outside and create that space. Um, you're really creating an, a moment and an environment where people are being able to deepen their connection um, with nature and with, and with the outdoors. And we're big believers in E.O. Wilson's theory of biophilia, which essentially says when people spend time in nature, they can't help but fall in love with it. Uh, we all have that innate love inside of us. Um, and we also believe people protect what they love. And so um, by getting people outside, we're not only supporting them in accessing all of the incredible health benefits, mental, physical, emotional of being outside, but also building that connection, that love and that, and that momentum to protect um, the outdoors in the future. And so that's a big part of why we were so obsessed with ecosystem restoration and, and pollinator protection. And in particular, pollinators, I think, are just such a huge, um, a huge point of leverage when we think about how do we really um, improve and restore our ecosystems on Earth. Um, so with that, um, I'll just share that, you know, the majority of, of land on Earth is in private hands. Uh, most of it, many of it, uh, within the hands of individuals, uh, nonprofits. Um, like many of you joining us today. And so while 
you know, government change is essential. There's so much we can do together, um, both in real world impact by actually doing a lot of what we'll talk about today by actually creating more habitat for pollinators, um, but also by just leading by example and showing everybody what's possible. So I thank you all for your leadership, uh, for your participation um, and your, for your commitment to create healthy ecosystems on earth for uh, many centuries and millennia to come. Thanks so much for sharing, Alyssa. Um, we're gonna hand it over now to Matthew Shepard from Xerxes Society, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about what we can do as hip campers, hip camp hosts, uh, to protect monarch butterflies and other pollinators. Take it away, Matthew. Great. Well, thank you, Remy. Um, thank you, Alyssa, for, for that background um, and that, that inspiration for, for why you and Hip Camp are, are here today. And thank you, Charles, for reaching out to me in the first place um, and starting us on this what, I mean, crazy journey, maybe. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But it, there's always some spark. Um, someone comes and says, hey, how about this? And we're like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. Um, and so thank you too to Remy for actually making this possible, logistics and Dean, um, uh, thank you for being here too. Um, and thank you to everybody else out there, um, whether you're from East Coast, West Coast, Canada, US, wherever you're joining us from, thank you for, for being here and making the time. Um, I'm going to launch um, presentation here. Um, and hopefully we can all see that now. Just, I, hope, I think that works right well. You should just be able to see my um, presentation screen now. Um, so yeah, so I've got just over half an hour of time when I'm going to introduce you to, to monarch conservation. Um, I'm going to um, I just spend a couple of minutes on, on who the Xerxes Society is, so you, so you have that background too, but then talk a little bit about why we should care about pollinators um, from the diversity of pollinators and then focus more on to um, monarch butterflies, you know, the, the things that they're dealing with in, in this world. Um, um, and then talk about how the, the pledge principles, um, the, the Hipcam and Xerxes pledge, you know, what, what they mean and how we can adapt those to um, monarch conservation. So the Xerxes Society, we are an environmental nonprofit. We're based in Portland, Oregon. Um, our fundamental mission is to protect the natural world through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. Um, and we are named for the Xerxes blue butterfly, which is one of the first butterflies recorded to go extinct in North America because of human activity. Um, it was actually last seen flying in 1943, and it was a butterfly of the San Francisco Peninsula. It lived on the um, ocean dune systems, um, which are now, you know, if you know San Francisco, that, that's now the Sunset District, or it's now the Golden Gate Recreation Area, or, you know, various other neighborhoods. And basically, as the city of San Francisco expanded, um, its habitat disappeared. And although we have this, this nice sounding mission at the most fundamental level, we want to prevent further extinctions. Um, we, uh, as an organization, we are donor funded and donor supported, and we have about 13, 14,000 members um, scattered around the world, although most are here in North America. Um, and we work through um, hands-on conservation so that we're working directly with farmers and land managers and agencies um, and, and gardeners and park managers and, and anybody because at the, mo the most basic level if we're not improving conditions on the ground by expanding habitat or improving the quality of the habitat that remains then we're not really having that fundamental impact because the most important thing that afflicts all wildlife is loss of habitat and so we're trying to get habitat back into our landscape. We also work through advocacy because we do like to maintain positive relationships with, with people as much as possible, but sometimes we have to just stand up and say, actually, no, that, you know, you, you should not be doing that. Um, or we're also working to um, achieve protection for rare and declining species. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee is the only um, be in the continental United States that's so protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act and 
that's a result of, of our work. We're also behind the effort to get the monarch butterfly protected. Um, uh, that's, that hasn't, we haven't achieved protection on that, but that's still in process. Um, we also want to take research because we are a, a science-based organization and we like to make sure that we have evidence to support everything we do, whether that's advocacy or advice to someone on the best way of preparing um, a, a, an area for a habitat creation or you know, education, et cetera, et cetera. And so we do work with um, a network of scientists around the world. Um, we also undertake our own research, a lot of um, survey work and um, trials of, of different techniques for habitat creation and such like. And then we're working through education and sometimes that's webinars or books or websites, social media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So why, why care about pollinators? Um, about, about, in fact, more than 85% of our flowering plants require a pollinator to move pollen um, and therefore fertilize flower. And as um, Charles said, you know, fruits, you know, seeds that we eat, whether that's, um, you know, almonds that you, you have in your granola or the, the apples in your pie or the blueberries on your yogurt, whatever that is, there's so, so much that we get directly. Um, and in fact, one in three mouthfuls of food and drink that we consume come directly from a pollinator. Um, and if you just want dollars, that, that's more than $30 billion value of crops in North America. But the true value of, of pollinators goes far beyond um, economic value and agricultural crops because they are at the heart of the healthy environment. Um, their, their work, um, enables flowers to produce seeds and fruit, which one sustains those plant communities and two feeds so much else that lives um, in those plant communities. Um, everything from, from game birds and songbirds all the way through to grizzly bears rely upon um, pollinated food at some point. Um, and also they do themselves become food. 95% um, of songbirds rear their young largely on insects, and a great majority of that is, is caterpillars, so moths and butterflies. Um, and to give you an idea of just how many caterpillars, it can, they, uh, um, uh, one pair of birds will need to fledge their, um, their offspring. Um, a study done of chickadees found that it can take anything between six and 10,000 caterpillars collected by one pair of chickadees to feed their young. So it, th these, these insects are at um, the center of so many complex food webs and maintain our, our environment in all sorts of different ways. And if you, if you step back and just think in broad brush, you know, they, they help define our seasons from the flowers in the springtime we see on the roadside, the meadows, you know, the, the, the berry picking that we do in the summer, jack-o'-lanterns, Halloween scares and Thanksgiving pie, all of those things come to us thanks to a pollinator and we frequently don't stop and think about it. The majority of our pollinators are insects. Um, if you were to look broadly, you would find there are some mammals that, that help pollinate. In fact, the largest pollinator in the world is probably um, in Madagascar. Um, uh, one, one of the lemurs there that feeds on flowers is probably the world's biggest pollinator. Um, and there are in, um, in the United States, there are a couple of species of bats that help to pollinate um, cacti in the Southwest deserts. And we do have hummingbirds that are widespread and are pollinators, but most pollinators are insects. Um, and the majority of those are in just a, a few groups of insects. And from the top left there, I mean, butterflies, in, including the monarch um, and moths, are valuable pollinators. There are flies that pollinate. Um, not all flies, but the flies that do pollinate are important. And the same in the lower left, the beetles. There are a good number of beetles um, that, that are, are pollinators. And then we have wasps and bees, which together make up um, the group known as Hymenoptera. And they, um, in particular, bees are obligate feeders on, on flowers and move so much pollen around. Um, but for today, we're, although these are the primary group of pollinators, um, we're looking at 
butterflies and in particular at the monarch butterfly. Um, so this is uh, one of those, those insects that is beloved everywhere. Um, and for an insect it, to have such an enthusiastic fan club is quite remarkable because for, for most insects, they're considered to be pesky little things, you know, but that's why people will bring in commercial um, sprayers to treat their garden, to get rid of mosquitoes and to get rid of pests. Um, and, and yet to have one insect that has a huge enthusiastic following is, is really quite inspiring. Um, and the monarch is an unusual butterfly. Um, in addition to being very large and colorful, it also has a remarkable life cycle. Um, and that may be one reason why it's so famous because of its um, migration and, and also because of its migration, it also connects communities across multiple states. Um, this map shows the, the general flow of monarchs across the country. Um, they overwinter um, along the California coast. There are several hundred small colonies of overwintering. They overwinter the majority of monarchs in the um, United States and then into Canada, uh, overwinter in central Mexico. And there's also increasing reports of small numbers of monarchs. Um, overwintering along the Gulf Coast and um, possibly even along the Carolinas. Um, and then we also do have um, in Florida and increasingly in Southern California, we have some resident populations where they're not migrating. Um, but from the overwintering sites, the monarchs will spread across the country. Um, from Mexico, they, they leave the overwintering sites in about February and then move into to Texas where they start breeding. And through about three or four generations, they will gradually move northwards um, across the Great Plains and um, up the East Coast. And they will reach as far as Southern, California, um, Southern Canada sorry, not California, but Southern Canada um, by, by the midsummer. In fact, they're already up there um, and are breeding and um, will remain there. And then on the West Coast, the um, butterflies that overwinter in California gradually spread across California and into surrounding states. Um, they will get as far north as um, Washington, British Columbia, Idaho, Montana, possibly. Um, but then we do have this corner of the, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States and British Columbia um, in the area to the, the ocean side of the Cascade Crest, where we, we don't have um, uh, monarchs typically because we don't have milkweeds growing there. And so we have this little corner of the United States, in fact, the corner where I live, where I, I actually sadly miss out on, on monarchs each summer, which is a great shame. So looking at um, the, the things that are affecting monarchs, um, the overwintering sites are a critical part of the, the annual cycle. And if we, we lose these sites, then potentially we can lose the entire migration. Um, the sites in Mexico are, are the big sites and they're being impacted by logging and increasingly now by extreme weather. So you have um, savage winter storms come in um, and the, the butterflies are exposed and can be directly killed by the winter weather. In California, the sites are much smaller and they're just, it's a piecemeal loss of sites through to the development because, you know, coastal California is, is a lot of development pressure. And um, there's also neglect of these groves. Um, the trees are growing older and senescing, um, particularly the eucalyptus that grow in these groves, um, which is another debate because eucalyptus are not native, but they are critically important for uh, um, overwintering monarchs in so many of these sites. Um, and so there's a lot of just small scale changes that are happening, sometimes not that obvious because they happen over a long period of time, but the quality of the groves is gradually declining. But butterflies also need the breeding habitat. Um, they leave their overwintering sites in the late winter and spread out across the landscape. And they need to find the milkweeds because they, milkweeds are the primary food source for the monarch caterpillar. Um, and milkweeds have been lost from so much of our landscapes. Um, agricultural areas, herbicide use on farms has wiped out 
tens of thousands of acres of um, milkweed. Um, and so milkweed is increasingly restricted to natural areas or, or roadsides or marginal places. Um, and these uh, sometimes are either tidied up, you know, how many roadsides do you see that get regularly mowed um, with the loss of the, the flowering plants and associated milkweed. But also these marginal sites, the, um, the milkweeds that, that remain are contaminated by insecticides applied to adjacent areas. Um, and we also have a problem now in some areas with non-native milkweeds growing, particularly in, in gardens, but I'll return to that one a little later. And then the third thing that the butterflies really need are, are nectar for adults. Um, and this is partly they need the nectar flowers around where the uh, milkweeds are because as the butterflies are migrating through several generations, they need the nectar to support those generations. Um, but also for the fall migration, um, the, the, the butterflies from California well, sorry, from across the West will fly back to California and in the East from Southern Canada all the way down to Mexico is a single generation, a 3000 mile flight. Um, and so we need to make sure that there is nectar in the landscape at the time when, when that migration is occurring. When we look at how many monarchs there are, um, Monarchs are unusual because they migrate and because they return to limited um, overwintering sites. Um, but this does give us an opportunity because when they're clustered, there's a good chance of being able to count and estimate how many monarchs there are. This is not something you can do when they're spread out across millions of square miles of, of, of um, the United States. And so in California, there's a project called the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count, which visits more than 400 sites each winter. Um, and they actually go in and, and estimate precise numbers of, of the monarchs. And last winter, there was a count of 248,000 monarchs were overwintering in California. In Mexico, um, World Wildlife Fund Mexico um, works with the government agencies there, and they have a slightly different way. They go in and they estimate the area of forest that's occupied by the monarch colonies. And from that, it is possible to um, at least have some idea of, of the precise number of monarchs, but the, the measurement is always by the acreage or actually the the hectare area covered by um, the, the colonies. And last winter, it was 2.84 hectares. Um, and there's two and a half acres in one hectare. So, I mean, that tells us that there was um, about seven acres of colonies. And so these estimates, I mean, are they good or bad? Um, we can look at the numbers for this last count and compare with the one before. And for California, um, the previous year, there were fewer than 2,000 monarchs counted in the overwintering sites. And so for this year, we've had you know, more than a hundredfold increase, which is superb. In Mexico, the, the, the area forest covered has gone up by, by 35%, which is great. I mean, these are really positive things. But overall, if we look back to the 1980s, the Western population has suffered a 95% decline and the Eastern population a 70% decline. And although the, there's been a huge amount of work that's done in the last few years, and we can celebrate the, these increases and be grateful and thankful to everybody who's worked so hard, there's so much more to be done because we, we, can't, we can't say that we've saved the monarch yet. Um, we know that there used to be um, between four and 10 million monarchs in overwintering in California. Um, and the Mexico, the, the current conservation plan um, has a target of six hectares as the minimum area of colony. Um, and that's just the, the kind of survival area. So we have so much more that needs to be done. Um, and that's where this, this amazing initiative from, from HIPCAMP comes in, um, because everybody can, can work to put a little bit more habitat back into our landscape. And by combining all of that, we can end up with a significant area, and not just a significant area, but a good spread of habitat across the, the monarch's migratory range. And so the, the, the HIPCAMP um, Xerxes pledge is based on the bring back the pollinators principles from Xerxes, which are 
to grow pollinator friendly flowers, to provide nests or egg laying sites, to avoid using pesticides and to share the word. Those are the four principles and they can be adapted to any location. Um, and the reason behind those particularly you know, the, 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 the need for flowers and egg laying and pesticide reduction. So we need to ensure there's adequate habitat to support the entire life cycle. Um, because if we're only doing one, I mean, yeah, it's fabulous to have more nectar for adults, but if there's nowhere for their caterpillars, then you're not gonna have another generation. And so how we can adapt to this, this pledge to monarch butterflies. The pollinated friendly flowers, this is the nectar for the adults. This fuels their breeding, this fuels their migration. Um, native plants are preferred. Um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that, that nectar rich native plants support um, a, a greater diversity of, of species. Um, and the target areas are, bloom during the breeding season and during the fall migration. Um, and the fall migration is going to be a fairly similar period of time for most people, but the breeding season can vary depending on where you are in the country. The egg laying sites um, for, for monarch butterflies, this means milkweed. We need the host plants to feed the caterpillars, but we also need to provide shelter for the chrysalis. Um, so the, 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 that third stage of, of the butterfly life cycle from adult to, um, or, you know, adult, then egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and then back to adult. Um, and so we're, we're meeting the requirements of all of those stages. Avoiding pesticides, we need to keep the habitat safe for monarchs. Um, we need to avoid having insecticide contaminated milkweeds. Um, we need to make sure that the, the plants are there. And sharing the word can be anything from putting up a sign to talk to your neighbor, social media, you know, whatever, you, whatever you can do to expand the conversation. Um, we've, we've discovered that uh, in most communities, the, the most powerful way of, of spreading conservation message is peer to peer. So neighbor to neighbor um, or community member to, to local newspaper or you know, whatever, but it's those individual conversations, individual connections that make so much difference. Um, looking to how you can actually do this in, in your landscapes. And I'm, I'm not doing a deep dive here. I'm, I'm really just scampering over the surface to give you some um, you know, broad picture of, of what can be done and how we can do it. Um, the pledge principles of, of you know, nectar plants and egg laying and avoiding pesticides and um, sharing the word. Can be, can be adopted anywhere and can be fitted into a small site. This is a suburban garden that you just, it happens it's just a couple of blocks from where I'm, I'm sitting in the Bay Area of California. And this, this one garden has all the elements of, of monarch habitat. They have the milkweeds, um, these tall plants here, this is showy milkweed. They, 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 they have that for the, for the caterpillars. They have the nectar plants here, and these are mostly native nectar plants. They have the, 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 the space for the chrysalis. The chrysalis will hang in the, in the bushes. Sometimes it'll hang on milkweed stems, but they have that kind of um, untidy structure to support the, provide shelter for the chrysalis. It's pesticide free. And this, they even have some signs here. So they, they provide all the elements in a small area. For the nectar, for the, the, for the adults, it fuels their breeding work, it fuels their flight, it fuels their migration. And the, the adults, um, eat the summer generations, the adults last between about two and five weeks of a whole, of a whole generation as they gradually fly um, away from the overwintering sites and, and expand across to take up the entire range. Um, and during that time, they, they, need, they need the nectar while they're breeding. And then the, um, the overwintering generation, actually they halt their um, development so that they don't breed until after they've overwintered. And those individual butterflies can live six to eight months, um, to cover the migration coming back when they need the nectar and then the time spent in the overwintering sites. The, the milkweeds for egg laying, um, 
they, the, the milkweeds need to be there in that period of time um, when, when the monarchs are passing through and, and breeding. Um, and that, so that does vary from one region to another. And, um, you know, so there's a range of different milkweeds that can be grown suited to your region. Um, the, the egg takes between three and five days to hatch. Um, it take maybe you know, a week and a half to two weeks to be feeding as the caterpillar on the milkweed. And the, the caterpillars are fairly mobile. And so they'll, they'll eat a milkweed. And if they've eaten it down um, to a, a raw stem, they'll just you know, crawl away and find another plant. The right type of milkweed, regionally appropriate native milkweeds. Um, some examples that I, I have here um, go, this, this picture goes from, um, from the west coast to the east coast uh, across the screen. Um, on the, the west coast, there's narrow leaf milkweed and um, showy milkweed. Um, are, are these two, these are the two very widespread ones. There are some more regional ones for the, for the hotter, more desert areas, such as um, this lower left is woolly pod. And um, the one in the, in the center bottom here is California. And then in sort of the Great Plains and the East Coast, we have swamp milkweed and we have butterfly milkweed and we have the common milkweed. And then, and, you know, another one, this is called antelope horns, this, this very green one here. This is one from, from the South. So there's a range of different milkweeds. In fact, there's about 70 species of milkweed native across the United States. Um, and it's always better to find your locally native milkweed. And then there's the wrong type of milkweed. And this is um, tropical milkweed, which is not native to most of the United States. That It's native to Mexico um, and maybe native right around the border, um, the southern border of the United States. But it's become very popular in gardens because, yes, it's an attractive plant. It grows all year. Um, it's easy to cultivate. Um, sorry, for the, for the nurseries. Um, it's a good one too. Um, and you'll find it in a lot of a lot, a lot of garden centers and big box stores, you'll find it and it's sold as a monarch friendly plant. Um, but unfortunately, it has some traits that makes it not very friendly for monarchs. Um, one of which is that it is evergreen. And so this, this plant is one reason why we are now finding non-migratory monarchs in Southern California. Um, because it is green at the time of the year when the monarch should be um, dormant and overwintering. And the presence of, of that green milkweed um, is leading some monarchs to break their dormancy and breed in the winter at the wrong time. And also because it's evergreen, um, it, unfortunately, it allows that there's a, a, a parasite. Um, it's a parasite of monarchs but it, the, the parasite can survive on the milkweed and the monarch comes, it lays an egg um, and then the, the, the egg hatches and the caterpillar starts eating the milkweed and then the caterpillar picks up the parasite and it's transferred from the caterpillar through the chrysalis stage and into the adult. Um, and this, this parasite can prevent adults from emerging and, and fully forming properly um, and also can weaken them. Um, and unfortunately, the, the life cycle of this parasite is sustained on the evergreen um, life cycle of this tropical non-native milkweed. So we encourage people to not grow this one. Um, the other aspects of habitat they need is shelter for the pupation for the, for the chrysalis. Um, the caterpillars will crawl away from where they were feeding. They don't crawl very far, but they just need to find somewhere where they can hang and complete this, this stage of their um, life cycle. And for, for most, it it's a couple of weeks is all they spend in, in, in this dormant. I say dormant, but it's not really dormant because during that period, they're going from a, um, a wriggling plant chewing um, caterpillar and they they change themselves through to um, this winged nectar drinking adult, um, a quite remarkable change. And then avoiding pesticides, um, it seems like a no brainer, but it's, it's part of this because pesticides are impactful to um, monarchs and, and pollinators of all sorts in very, various different ways. Um, insecticides directly will impact um, 
the, 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 the insects. Um, a lot of insecticides, particularly neonicotinoids um, and other systemic products, i.e. products that are designed to get inside the tissue of the plants. Um, they're, they're designed to kill um, sap sucking and plant chewing insects. Um, and obviously caterpillars are plant chewing insects. And so there are direct impacts on, on caterpillars. Um, and also now these, these um, systemic products do actually come out in the nectar and pollen. So they can also um, impact the adults when they're feeding on the nectar. Sharing the word, um, as I was saying, oh, this can be anything from a conversation to you know, a sign to a social media campaign. And there's no right or wrong way of doing it. And it's not, I mean, we always encourage people to do it. And I know for some people, it's a little bit nerve wracking because you're not even quite sure. It's like, well, if I go and tell my neighbor, you know, why my garden doesn't look like their, their, their pristine manicured mown lawn. Um, that can be a scary conversation sometimes. And I know that there's a lot of emotions um, attached to this idea of a pristine, perfectly manicured landscape. And so it can be as simple as just put a sign out. It doesn't have to be a, a real fancy sign. It can be anything you, anything you can create. But we just find it's really helpful um, if there's some communication going out about why your garden um, doesn't look like a neighbor's. And sometimes that can lead to other people wanting to do what you've done. And sometimes it just makes it um, easier for neighbors to accept. And then another conservation challenge that, that we're facing is captive rearing. Um, this seems like a really great thing to do because somehow when we've had such low numbers of monarchs, if you can be growing more and releasing more, isn't that good? Um, the, the reality is that the number of monarchs that, that released is not really big enough to impact that wild population. Um, and unless you're managing your rearing with extremely careful um, hygiene um, protocols and procedures, you again, unfortunately, this becomes a problem with that, that parasite, um, which is called OE and, and has a much longer scientific name. And I'm always really pleased that people call it OE because that's the easy one. Um, but again, you can have this parasite that will be um, passed from, from caterpillar to caterpillar. Um, and, you know, but if you release those, um, the final adults into the wild that are carrying this, this disease, then you can spread it within the wild population. Um, so yes, I think there is a place for, for some rearing just for, you know, for simple pleasure. And so if you're rearing just a handful of caterpillars um, collected from the wild, it's a fascinating experience to watch them grow and just to watch the transformation and the emergence and the, and the, the pleasure of, of releasing an adult at the end. Um, but keep, it, keep the numbers really small, be really careful with, with hygiene. Um, to have them mixed in one container like this is a real no-no. Um, you need to keep individual caterpillars in individual containers so that so that they're they're um, kept in the cleanest conditions possible, um, and just you know keep the numbers small. So probably you know only five. I mean less than ten um, is probably okay. Um, just looking specifically at. California, and I know this is um, where, where Hit Camp originates and where Charles and I first started talking about, gosh, if we we're going to do this, how can we do it? Um, so I wanted to share that these are the, the priority zones for, for re recovering the, the monarch butterfly in California specifically, but also for the West Coast. And you'll see that there are different areas of, of the state where different things are suitable. Um, if we're just looking at the coastal zone, um, the, the coastal zone is where these overwintering sites are. In fact, the overwintering sites um, are from kind of Mendocino County down south down the coast. And in this area, we encourage people to um, plant nectar plants, but not milkweeds, because there's, um, if the milkweeds are too close to the overwintering sites, then you can break that overwintering cycle. Um, and so, so if you're in the north coast area, which is yellow on this map, there's no, there's no overwintering sites, so there's, there's no restriction or no issues with planting milkweed. Um, 
once the butterflies leave these overwintering sites and they spread across the coast range and out into the central valley, this is the, this is a key area for that first generation. Um, and for any of you who know the central valley, you know it's pretty short in habitat now. Um, and so this um, this this it's the first breeding zone for for butterflies leaving overwintering sites. So this is what we need to focus on. The, the early growing milkweeds um, uh, um, and so and, and also nectar plants to support that that generation um, and then once they get beyond those in into the summer um, then it's more you know again you can have some of these later blooming species of, of milkweed out there um, and again nectar plants and all of this try and keep it clear of, of pesticides I do want to mention overwintering sites before I wrap up. Um, I, I'm guessing that not many hip camp owners have an overwintering site, um, but if you do, this is one where where it's really, you know, you should seek, we encourage you to seek out expert advice and, you know, come to Xerces and we can help you and connect you um, because there are not many overwintering sites that are essential to um, the, the life cycle and the annual migration, migratory cycle of, of monarchs. Um, and they, as I say, there's a kind of the Goldilocks zone of condition in, in these overwintering sites of so the cool weather, protection from extreme storms, water, um, the right level of sunshine, not too hot, not too cold, you know, I mean, just the right kind of nectar and so on. Um, but this is not, overwintering sites are not something that most people will have to worry about because most people won't have overwintering sites. And then just just wrapping up here, um, a few other things um, that you that you might want to get involved with. Um, there are community science projects and programs around um, Xerces Society. We do have the 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 Thanksgiving count, which is a very particular one that people can participate in. Uh, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper is one where you can um, submit observations of, of monarchs at any life cycle stage or, or milkweed um, observations. Um, and through that, we're building up a better and better picture of where monarchs go at different times of the year. That's, for example, why we're able to come up with the priority zones for California. And then there are others, you know, once you get um, start looking for monarchs, you're going to find bumblebees too. So there's other projects. And then Journey North is a great one for um, uh, Following the migration for the for the western sorry for the eastern states, um, Project Monarch Health, the Monarch Lava Monitoring Project, focus on um, that parasite, that OE parasite, and its spread and containment. I do want to mention B City USA and B Campus USA um, because if you're starting with your own pollinator and monarch habitat, you might want to get your um, your community involved at a, at a broader level. And so this is one, op one opportunity to do things at a citywide, a townwide activity and, and get yourself um, certified and part of a larger organization, a larger movement. Um, there are books out there. You can get them from wherever you get um, your books or from your public library. Um, these are, are Xerxes um, produced books um, on Gardening for butterflies, plants for monarchs, and if you want to get into other pollinators, um, bees and, and um, beetles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there's books there. You can go to our website, which is xerces.org, and you'll find a whole host of information that you can download, fact sheets on establishing milkweed or the best nectar plants or how to um, establish a meadow or, you know, uh, on and on and on. There's lots of stuff there, as well as more de detailed guidelines for um, creating um, meadows or you know managing broader landscapes for monarchs and so on. Um, you can also go to YouTube where you'll find um, the Xerces channel has a lot of um, habitat webinars and other materials for, for folks who prefer to, to learn through listening and viewing. You can follow us on, on social media and we'll share hints and tips, um, as well as any new um, materials that are coming out. And that's it. So thank you so much for your, your time and patience today. Um, I'll hand it back to Remy. Thank you so much. And 
Matthew, just real quick, we've had a couple questions that I think we might be able to get um, pretty quickly that I think sure. I'd like to ask. So um, one is, how do we know if we live in an area where we should plant milkweed or not? Is there somewhere like maybe on the Zers website that people can go to look into that? Um, yeah, um, I mean, the, the, the milkweed free zone is a really narrow zone along the, the California coast, and the southern California coast. Um, and we normally recommend that, that people avoid planting um, milkweeds within about five miles of the coast okay. um, from about Mendocino southward. And that, that, that's, the, that's the simplest um, single guidance. It, it gets a bit more detailed, but we can certainly dive into that another time. Excellent. And then um, can you just suggest a couple of organizations in uh, Canada that people could look into for their similar, um, similar uh, knowledge? Um, uh, Wildlife Preservation Canada is one that I would, I would recommend. Um, as for others, gosh, no, I, I can't, but we, we, we can help you in Canada too. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, either that or I can check in with our staff who um, have connections there and we can we can find alternatives. Fantastic. Well, we had a lot of other questions coming in, but I think I'll save those for the Q&A. Um, sure. In the meantime, thank you so much for sharing and I hope everyone is so excited to get started on their pollinator gardens. I'm going to pass it over to Charles Post, who's going to be talking with Dean from Oz Farms um, about his experience stewarding, stewarding a pollinator friendly ecosystem in Northern California. Awesome. Thank you, Remy. And Matthew, thank you. That was just an abundance of knowledge and wisdom. And I feel like it's all just digesting. I'm, I'm super grateful for uh, the download. Um, I did quickly want to just put my ecologist hat on and just I have a few, there were a few things that kind of popped in my mind that I thought I'd love to share uh, to kind of build on to what Matthew was, was digging into just really briefly. And one is just the word ecology. Ecology, if you look at the Greek root of it, it breaks down to the study of one's home. So when we think about pollinators and we think about the work that Dean's doing at Oz Farm, we're really talking about getting to know your home better, right? Like putting the time into peeling that onion back and looking at the little subtleties and the layers that make the places we call home so incredible. And I think when we, when we think about pollinator conservation, the successes and the failures and the opportunities, I think so much of it comes down to this fact that pollinators are these often these really small, they're not, you know, they're not furry, they're not cuddly, they're not extraordinarily charismatic, and yet they do so much important work and they are outside of our windows and outside of our front doors and balconies and stoops, like literally making magic happen 24 seven. And so again, back to that root of ecology, it's just getting to know the places we call home better and stewarding our homes. So you can have beauty and brilliance and flowers and bird song. And I talked to one of my friends and mentors, this guy, Cyrus Sutton, he's just a wonderful human. And he, he planted the seed within my mind, which was planting a nut or a fruit tree is one of the greatest ROIs, returns on investments that you can have as a landowner. Because you put that tree in the ground, you put some pollinator plants or some native pollinator friendly plant, plants in the understory and you're getting food, generational food that your grandkids can benefit from or your neighbors and community members. You're creating habitat for pollinators, shade, uh, you know, water retention, erosion control. Like it's so incredible and pollinators benefit and so do you. And so it's really, yeah, it just brings me back to the city of home, which I think is a, a, a nice segue into Dean and Oz Farm and this home that, that Dean that you've created and I've had the privilege to visit a few times and just was totally uh, blown away and, ins and inspired and impressed by all the work and intention you have, um, you and your team have kind of woven into this place. And so, you know, maybe if I could just start with one broad question that you can unpack a little bit is when you live in this wild ecosystem, right? Oz Farm is surrounded by intact nature, places where wild salmon still exist. Uh, ancient forests still thrive, um, wild rivers and streams still exist, which is increasingly rare in the, in, in the world. Dean, what's it like stewarding a home in this kind of wild matrix where you're you know, pursuing goals maybe that have an out, output of say food for the community or an experience for guests, but you're also having to, to kind of 
balance this this wild existence where pollinators are coming from the forest and the meadows into your working lands and, and talk to talk us through the kind of that mindset and kind of that journey that you've been on. Sure, I'd love to. First, let me thank you, Charles, for contacting me and getting me involved with this project. And Matthew, thanks for all the details and really cool info on the monarchs and Remy for organizing and Alyssa, it's great to see you. It's been a while. Um, for me, I'm sort of opposite to Matthew in the sense that we paint a really broad stroke here. We don't have a specific focus on a specific insect. Um, we sort of try to paint a really broad stroke by attracting as many different types as we can um, through you know, our ecological practices for the most part. And in other ways, um, we have grazing land here. So through grazing practices of our meadows and then ultimately involving the river that we have that runs through the property and then um, our forestry practices. So it is very multi-pronged. And what it's like to live here, it's, um, it's busy. And, I, and sometimes we just keep our head down and we keep working. But you know, when we have people from hip camp come and visit on the weekends and stay with us, it's always really rewarding to hear how much joy people get to have from experiencing the work that we put into the land here to produce the safe space for people to come outside and experience nature and also to interface with our sort of niche, which is agro um, ecology and through that agritourism. And Dean, uh, a hero of ours, EO, the late EO Wilson, you know, I was listening to a, an interview he gave about pollinators and he was advocating for everybody to get on their hands and knees and really watch pollinators at work and to see mm. the industrious and, and the brilliance that, uh, that these pollinators exhibit day in and day out. Talk to us about guests coming or visitors coming to your place and maybe experiencing pollinators or nature or working lands or intact ecosystems for the first time like how, how do you meet them where they're at and also start to yeah peel back that onion a little bit and, and expose this beauty this this landscape that you steward that's a good question i like to do it very subtly some people are more uh engaged with you know questioning all the happenings around here. Other people sort of want to come and go um, and not have that sort of interaction and sort of educational component to what they're doing with the land and interfacing. But I think regardless, everyone has some sort of takeaway and experience here that they can take with them um, back into their, you know, whatever city or towns that they're coming from. And um, biophilia, like uh, Alyssa was saying, I think is a real thing. And what I try to do when people come to visit is, you know, if they show any interest in anything, I'll spend as much time as they want to spend before they say, okay, I got to go. I'm on vacation, uh, sort of inoculating them with ideas of how they can take this home with them to steward their own land or to steward their own little, you know, um, suburban landscape, like Matthew was saying. I think you can do so much with so little. And one thing about farming is that it, when you put work into the land, it is really hard work, but it's like, a million fold rewarding and it's so addictive. So if anyone has land that's a hip camp owner here, I would say definitely um, get your hands dirty and plant some pollinator gardens. It's very addicting. Flowers aren't just food for the pollinators, they're food for the soul too. And um, you'll get 100, 100x fold all the work you put in. And um, it's something like Matthew was saying can provoke the conversation of conservation and stuff like that. Um, the wild, yeah, tend, tend those wild gardens. The lawns are um, wasting water and they're not uh, food for anything, so. And one of the things that, you know, as a, as a gardener myself, I often talk about, you know, the best time to start a garden was yesterday. And, and you know, I just moved to Norway, but had a garden in, in Montana that was a few years old and it took three years before the monarchs showed up. But when they did, it was one of the best days, days of my life. And so talk to us a little bit about like what investing in land feels like for you. I mean, you're doing things that won't really come to life, come to bloom, come to fruition for maybe a season or a year, but you're, you're slowly investing in this place, knowing that something magical is going to unfold. So kind of talk us through right. for anybody who's maybe has never made a garden before, but they're thinking about it. Like talk us through that kind of journey. It's, easier than it's ever been, of course, with all the information online to figure out how to actually grow stuff. Uh, 
really cool you brought up the nut tree because the best time to plant a garden is yesterday but the next best time is right now and we're blessed because there's been people farming this land since the 60s and we've been certified organic since 1990 and one of the greatest things here is a hundred year old walnut tree that they planted up in Mendocino when you build a barn. I guess it was common practice to plant a walnut tree next to it. So there's this really old ginormous walnut tree that uh, everyone calls the grandmother tree here in the home tree because you just can't plant one like that today and expect it to look and have that same mycelial network underneath that permanent um, shade that creates all this abundance of life under the soil. And then by virtue of that, um, the insects and all the plants that grow around that zone. And it feels like when you have, so we have also an established orchard, but it's only about 20 years old. And then we also have the annual production in our fields. And when you have a mixture of all those things, I get, you get the best of all the worlds because like Matthew saying, you do need that habitat for things to nest and overwinter, but then annual production can provide a lot more of the flowers um, that we, you know, honestly used to also create revenue streams for our farm. And I love that example. And I have to imagine that you, you have guests who either know about Oz Farm, see the photos, um, you know, learn about it through word of mouth. But I know for myself, having visited there before, people are drawn to your place and places like Oz Farm because of that vibrant ecosystem, that vibrant ecosystem because of the life. And so there's obviously the revenue streams that come from the perennial or the annual garden, the, 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 the produce you grow and the other things that come from the land. But I, I would also imagine that there's that experience that's drawing people, that people are seeing the grandmother tree, seeing the river, seeing these threads of the ecosystem you steward. And, and that's probably a draw. Would you, is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, we're, we're blessed to live in an area that's so diverse. Um, you know, we are also two miles from the coast and we have a fault line running through the middle of the property, the San Andreas. We have that river, we have the redwoods. It's, um, you can explore a lot here and never really get to the bottom of everything. That's why I was saying about painting that broad stroke here. We sort of just try to create as much ecological diversity, abundance, and in that we find like the balance that we're, we're sort of lacking based on, you know, the fact that it was clear cut here a hundred years ago and people did overgraze here for generation after that. So just rebuilding that like natural stability is sort of my passion here and going through the forest and sort of thinning out the forest in a, in a way that can help it regrow into an old growth forest, um, grazing responsibly the land with rotational grazing to get that carbon sequestration. Um, and then all the planting we do to not just grow the food, but also bring the pollinators in because our largest crop is apples. If you don't have any pollinators, you don't get any apples and then we lose the whole crop. So um, the pollinators are very, very important. And if it's pretty interesting, if you see like a storm happen in the middle of a flowering, because we have over 50 varieties of apples, if there's a storm during, uh, they don't all flower at the same time, but if one of them is flowering during a storm, you'll see there's no apples that year because the bees can't get to them. All the native pollinators can't get to them. So it really does impact the stability of our like uh, work that we do here from a, like a economical standpoint, if nothing else. And so maybe a, you know, a final question would be if you could, could you speak to kind of the importance of community, right? Like you're, you're, you're not an island, right? You're surrounded by other working lands, by wild lands, by people on, you know, various legs of their journey of stewardship. And, and maybe you could talk us, talk us through kind of your approach as you think about the practices you're making and, and the way that you uh, behave and, and steward the land in this broader context of a community, of a watershed of, you know, you watch a pollinator fly into your yard or past your window or past your front door or whatever it might be. And it came from somewhere, you know? And so it's really there, not just because your place is suitable and attractive, but also because maybe your neighbor's place is suitable and attractive. And so maybe can you talk us through kind of like the approach and mindset lessons, tips uh, about around community and, and conservation. 
community is a really big thing here. It was, you know, your classic hippie commune in the 60s here. So the idea of community is sort of ingrained in the ethos here. And outside of that, it's a very uh, counterculture hippie sort of area up here that a lot of people care a lot about community. And it's not the kind of place where you go get off work, drive into your garage and close it and don't talk to anyone around you. You know, a lot of people, they say like, if you want to, uh, what's the expression? You want to find out who, find the person that owes you money or find out what's going on around town, you go to the post office. It's hard to get anything done when you go into town because you'll be there all day chatting people up that, you know, are from other kind of woodsy properties like this. Um, so community is really big and we try to foster community here. We have an apprenticeship program um, where we promote the idea that we live in community here. We do different shifts on cook nights and things like that. The community at large is something we're trying to nurture more than ever. We started a nonprofit last year to um, promote community food access and to grow more farmers and more gardens in the you know, Mendocino coast. So community is something we think about all the time and sort of uses our like North Star for all good things, bringing people together. And this property is really good at this, it holds space. We do like harvest celebrations every year. We do lots of family reunions, stuff like that. So community is on the forefront of everything we do here. And food is a great way to bring people together. You know, we do a lot of the meals with the food we cook. And yeah, um, I don't know what else to say about that. Community is number one, yeah. Well, I love that. And I think the, the things you just shared, right? Uh, food, uh, people coming together, um, this intention to create space for new and, and, and uh, aspiring farmers, all of those things require pollinators. Totally. And so, you know, and so I think, it, again, it comes back to that idea that Alyssa shared earlier, earlier, which is that without pollinators, we lose so much the tapestry unravels. And so, yeah, I really appreciate you sharing your experience and sharing a little bit more about what Oz Farm is like, what you all do, your values, uh, the projects. I love it. It's an honor to be a part of Hip Camp and these projects that Alyssa and you come up with uh, really show the integrity behind the organization. And like you're saying, the Insects don't have that cute factor that other things have that get all this attention for conservation, um, but they have such an important, like what you're saying, underlying fabric that holds everything together. So really big respect for taking care of them and yeah. spreading the message. Well, and one of the cool things is that yeah, pollinators, are, pollinators are considered, you know, can be considered umbrella species where you protect pollinators and so many other species are underneath that umbrella. So it's really a wonderful place for us to direct our collective gaze as we think about planting a garden, making a pollinator habitat, um, you know, whether it's on your stoop, your backyard, your farm, your community garden, uh, your roof. Um, it's really kind it's, of- yeah. It's so true. And with Hip Camp having properties all over the place, it really does make sense what Matthew was saying that the you know traveling insects can connect through these networks if we can build them. It's sort of, it's really cool to, to have that tapestry. It's really cool. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And Remy, I'll pass it back to you. I know we're getting close to our Q&A. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Dean, um, for sharing all that. It's been really inspiring. So yeah, like Charles said, we're going to open it up for our Q&A. Uh, please feel free to drop your question using the Q&A function on the bottom there. Put it in the chat. Um, we've actually already got some coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, quick one for Matthew. How can people get involved in the Thanksgiving Monarch Count? Um, yeah, we um, normally recruit volunteers. Um, gosh, I, recruitment normally starts in the sort of the late spring and into the summer. So we're probably looking now because there is some training involved. Um, I'm not sure for the last couple of years with the pandemic going on, we were not recruiting more volunteers just because you know we weren't having groups of people um so i'm but i can certainly get that information out and when 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 um the the folks on our staff who who oversee the count are getting to that point um then i can push information out to people but yeah just if you if you follow us on social media there'll be an announcement going out or if you want to know specifically you can always email monarchs at xerces.org and get in con direct contact with the folks who run it 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's go over here. Um, let's see. If someone runs a homeschool group, what are some good resources for educating children about pollinators and how to protect them? Um, the best thing I think that we can offer at the moment, and I know it will depend on the on the age group, but we have um, a project called X Kids, which is um, an activity booklet that will lead people through a series of um, science-based activities in which they learn about invertebrates in their, in their neighborhood. Um, and that does include pollinators. Um, there are also some other, I mean, Xerces, we don't have any, any direct um, resources, uh, curricular resources and so on, but there are other organizations out there such as Pollinator Partnership that do have some um, pollinator curricular materials that would be suitable. Perfect. And yes, Heather added that they will be elementary age, so. Okay. The other X kids is aimed for fourth and fifth graders. Um, so. All right. Um, this one, let's see, maybe Charles or Matthew can take this. Uh, this person, Jonathan, has an Appalachian Bee Collective that has put out thousands of non-native honeybee hives. Um, it's put a tremendous pressure on the native pollinators. Unlike most places, we have lots of natural native habitat for pollinators. Um, Jonathan's tried to convince the collective to stop raising non-native bees. Um, are you doing anything to educate people about the extreme harm of raising honeybees is doing to native pollinator populations? Do you have any suggestions on how we can convince people that maybe not all pollinators are created equal? And feel free to open the Q&A if you'd like to reread that. Re -read that. I know that was- um, Well, I, no, I, I did actually read that one mm -hmm. whilst um, Charles and Dean were talking. So um, yeah, I mean, um, at Xerxes Society, we're doing what we can, but this um, the, there is direct conflict between honeybees and, and native bees. Um, and we've had so many conversations with people. I mean, just last week, I, I did a webinar all about this for another, another organization. Um, and it, it's a really awkward topic because um, I, I encounter some people who are um, entirely dedicated to honeybees and I get it. I mean, we need honeybees for um, you know, our commercial ag. Uh, there are places where the landscapes are so degraded that probably having honeybees is not too terrible. Um, but we do need to be thinking carefully about where honeybees are being placed and whether there is enough habitat to support honeybees because our landscapes have been degraded. You know, you just look at the monarch, which is the focus of, of today's um, event. And one of the reasons is that there's not enough habitat to support the monarch across the landscape. Um, and so bringing in a, a, another hive and putting it in the existing landscape is just adding pressure. And so we really need to be focused on creating more habitat um, uh, so that there's, there's more to support the native bees, there's, there's more to support honeybees. Um, I also always ask people to, to think about why they want to hive um, and whether beekeeping is really going to get, get them to the end point they, they want or whether they can focus on, on habitat. There's a, an organization in Britain called Bug Life that just last year put out a, a statement, which I thought was interesting, which very closely aligned with, with what Xerxes are doing, but they actually said, and it said, hey, you know, you're gonna put a hive of bees out, you should consider putting, creating two hectares of additional habitat to support that hive. And so that's five acres of habitat um, and that was a really interesting guidance. I mean, every time you, you add a hive, add five, five acres of habitat. Um, uh, I don't know whether that's possible for most people, but it's a really, it's a really good, um, a, a good starting point. But also to go back to the, the origin, the, 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 the fundamental question here, which was what can be done to check, you know, are, are there things that we can do to be trying to convince these folks in, in this, um, honeybee collective not be doing it and um, I don't know if there is I have to be totally honest about that um, and I have spoken with with um, beekeepers um, who don't see the difference between a honeybee and a native bee um, and just consider to be any bee to be okay um, and the reality is that we really do need our native bees there um, you know, at least a quarter of the plants in this country cannot be 
effectively pollinated by a honeybee. So, you know, replacing, uh, you know, hundreds, and there are about 3,600 species of bees native to this country. And so trying to replace 3,600 species with one, it doesn't work. Um, the, 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 the ecology that we have, the, you know, the ecosystems that we have, um, the plant communities are based upon that diversity of bees, bees and plants, this process of co-evolution. Um, and so we, we need the diversity of bees that we have in order to support the diversity of plants that we have. Um, and so simply bringing in you know, more honeybees, we, we're creating conflict and competition for the nectar and pollen. Um, and we're, there is enough evidence to suggest that honeybee hives uh, or the presence of honeybees are, are pushing out native bees. Um, and so, but we really need those native bees in order to sustain the plant communities and the ecology that we have. Awesome, thank you, Matthew. And um, Matthew, I have a, oh, sorry, Ryan. No, please go ahead. I had a quick little follow-up question, Matthew. It's, it's, it's not supposed to be a trick question, but it's, it's uh, I just want to go to my mouth. So would it be better for somebody to plant a planter box of non-native plants and attract European honeybees than to not have in, any uh, flowers or you know poll pollinator habitat, uh, you know, at their at their house or where they live. Uh, um, I would say yes, on the basis that non-native plants will still be supporting some native bees. So I mean non-native plants, and and there is some evidence to suggest that honeybees will preferentially visit non-native plants. Again, it's their process of co-evolution in, in Europe or you know, the, what we know as the honeybee naturally occurred in Europe, Asia and Africa. Um, and so if they, they will preferentially visit plants that they co-evolved with. So honeybees in this country will go and visit you know, lavender or whatever that, that people have got in their garden that, that's a European plant. Um, but lavender, for example, is still a great support for bumblebees and mason bees and mining bees and other bees. So if, if you only plant, have a planter of non-native plants, you are bringing some benefit to the native bees. Although we do know that native plants support a greater abundance and a greater diversity of native bees. So we always encourage people to plant native plants, but except that in a garden, it's going to be different um, and non-native plants will bring some benefits. Yeah, the, I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate answering that because I think it's interesting, right? Like I think a lot of people are on different parts of this journey. Maybe, you know, as Dean pointed out, they have a patch of lawn and then maybe there's this progression of, you know, you find a, a few flowers at the market or at the grocery store or wherever and, you know, and then it, it grows into this, the lawn becomes this next iteration, mm -hmm. a little bit of color sprinkled in. And then hopefully we can bring people along to, yeah, maybe the pollinator, the, you know, the native plant dominated pollinator garden. Um, yeah, I, I, I say anything we can do to bring diversity, to bring wildness back into our manicured landscapes is going to be better. On that note, for those who are just starting their pollinator gardens, do you know any organizations that will come uh, help plant pollinator gardens for you or they can provide the plants for you or anything that'll make it kind of easier for people to start creating that environment? Um, goodness, it's like, we're like playing Stump the Chump, aren't we today? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I again, I, I'm sure that locally in different areas, you may find some local, because I know there are all sorts of um, local nonprofits around the country who come in and, and help you garden, or there's the native plant societies that can help. Um, there's always gonna be master gardeners who are a great source of, a, a, of advice, but not necessarily someone who can physically come and plant. Um, I mean, at the Xerces Society, we work with um, farmers and other land managers doing larger scale projects and so can can help provide guidance on on those kinds of um, habitat creation projects but we still don't we don't have the staff to, to like turn up and, and do the planting for you mm -hmm. um, it'd be one it'd be wonderful um, but we're not able to do that so. 
Um, what are, what is Xerxes thoughts on tagging monarchs to track their movement, um, via small stickers that are applied to the wing? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, no, I mean, there's a couple of, um, organizations, including Monarch Watch, which is, um, based in, um, Kansas. Um, and this has been an incredibly valuable project that's been going on for a long time, because again, this is the reason why we know where monarchs breed and where they end up to overwinter, because people have been marking monarchs with these little tags. Um, and so that, that, that does produce some very valuable um, data. And so that, you know, we know from that where, where monarchs originated and, and where they end up. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, let's see here. I understand, I, we have a question here that is, how does this all relate to indigenous sovereignty in the land back movement? Um, I'm not sure if I know the answer to this one, maybe Alyssa or Charles could chime in on this. Um, what do you guys think? I'm happy to jump in and then would love to open it up to, to others. Um, really good question. Um, over Charles fact check, 80% of the world's biodiversity is on indigenous owned and managed lands currently. Is this correct? Yes, that's what I've I've read and, and our um, TEK expert uh, has confirmed this uh, from previous work. Yeah, so in previous um, programs we've run as a company where we've actually worked with landowners like Dean on the ground, we've always included um, a indigenous ecological expert to really help provide that perspective because as the original stewards of the earth, I would say um, it's very ingrained in indigenous culture to feel this just connectivity as an essential element of life, right? If all of the bugs are dying, obviously there's go it's going to come to us eventually if it, if it hasn't already, and I would argue it already has, given that one in five deaths are already caused by pollution. So um, I think we're right on um, the precipice of a lot of big changes culturally. I'll speak specifically here to the United States. I just saw, I think it was yesterday that, and I believe this is the first time this has happened with federal land in the United States. Um, Bears Ears is, is going to actually be jointly managed, um, not just by the BLM, but by a consortium of five tribes in the area. Um, this is a huge deal. Uh, we need that indigenous perspective. Again, these uh, indigenous people are the original stewards of this land, especially here in North America. That perspective has not been centralized enough. Um, I'll also call out that while um, the conservation community and ecological community, I think for a while has known this and talks about the perspective and the knowledge of indigenous peoples, particularly as it relates to land and habitat management, it's also critical to recognize we cannot have that conversation without, without also having the broader conversation of indigenous rights more broadly um, and the fate and well-being of our um, indigenous citizens and, and friends and, and colleagues. And so it's, it's a big conversation. It's a broad conversation. Hopefully that's a bit of a little bit of how we're thinking about it um, that's helpful, but it's very, it's very central to this work. It's a really good question. And again, I think right at the, right at the precipice of some big cultural changes that are starting to happen. Charles or Dean or Matthew. And I think what I might add just quickly is that, you know, as somebody who has trained in, you know, the Western ecological field, I've been on a really, uh, you know, rewarding journey of, of, of learning, of expanding my knowledge base of indigenous perspectives around stewardship and, and a book that's changed my life. And I'm sure many of, many of our lives is braiding sweetgrass. And so that's, there you go. That's been oh, just- got to call it out. <laughs> yeah, it's just been an incredible kind of, uh, yeah, textbook for how to, to kind of learn from the, the wisdom and experiences of peoples who have been stewarded in these lands for so long. So that I would encourage anybody interested to consider reading that book as a great place to start or continue your education. Yeah, if you have not read this book, I can't uh -huh. recommend it enough. Robin is um, actually a classic trained botanist in the Western scientific worldview and also an indigenous uh, leader. And so she's able to blend these two worldviews in a way that, that I think really takes the best of both um, and provides a really compelling picture for how to move forward here. And I'll say one of the things I most appreciate about her perspective, which of course is not, you know, 
a full representation of all indigenous perspectives or anything like that, but it's a much more positive um, and relationship driven um, worldview. One of the most compelling moments in this book to me is she is a professor and she's asking her class, you know, write down all the associations you have when I say the word, you know, the environment and humans. And all of the students, most of whom are, you know, raised in the United States, Western minded, it's all incredibly negative. You know, we're destroying it, we're hurting it, we're killing it. And she's like, what is going on? Because in her world, in the indigenous worldview, the, the outdoors is, it's our family, it's our home, as Charles said, the ecology. Um, it's something to be loved and cherished, it's there to support us, that we have this beautiful reciprocal relationship with. And so I think when we talk about leave it better, when we talk about the Anthropocene, you know, let's make it a good one. Um, these might sound like kind of new ideas, uh, but really, I think in the indigenous worldview, that's like, you know, duh, of course, <laughs> uh, kind of like foundational foundational thoughts and theory. So very, very much recommend this book. We actually got gave every single employee at Hip Camp a copy of this book this year because that's how much we love it. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Alyssa and Charles, for taking that. Um, we are butting up on the end of our time together here. So I just want to thank you all so much. I hope you are all so excited to apply some of what you've learned to your very own garden or field or planter box. Um, your efforts are so important in project protecting the community um, and stewarding a pollinator garden. No matter how small, if you have a planter box or a field, it's all important. So uh, a couple last closing thoughts. If you've not already, please sign our pollinator, pollinator protection pledge. I'm adding that in the chat right now. Um, quick update, we've already got about 550 people that have signed the pledge um, and it's growing. So please share it, um, sign it. We've got more to come. Um, as a reminder to those of us and those of you that are hip camp hosts, um, soon we will be sharing um, participating hosts that have signed the pledge on our hip camp homepage and elsewhere. Uh, also, finally, keep an email, keep an eye on your email um, for an invitation for our next webinar in this series, where we're going to talk about how to tend your garden into peak summer season and what to plant for your fall pollinator garden and prepping for the rainy season. Um, finally, happy solstice and thank you all so much for joining us. We hope to see you at our next webinar and continue to spread the word. Thank you all for joining.